Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Investing in the Educational Success of Black Women and Girls book launch. My name is Patty Webb, and I'm the Marketing Manager for Stylus Publishing. Stylus webinars bring you direct access to our authors and our latest titles. Today, I'm happy to introduce Lori Patton Davis, Charlotte E. Jacobs, and Venus Evans Winters, editors of Investing in the Educational Success of Black Women and Girls. A quote from one of our reviewers, this book is a must read for anyone interested in understanding race, gender, and equity in education. The text pushes our understanding of black women and girls beyond the stereotypical model minority myths of magic. The authors unpack the complexities of experiences that include injustice and resilience within the education and across intersecting systems. This critical resource positions black women and girls at the center, which is where they belong, in post-secondary research and beyond. This book came out in January, 2022 with Stylus. Joining our panel will also be Dr. Janice A. Bird, Dr. Krista J. Porter, Dr. Dorothy E. Hines, Dr. Monique Lane, Dr. Tiffany Steele, Dr. Taika Robinson, founder and executive director, Vivian Anderson, and Mildred Bovola. Yep. So without further ado, I will pass the mic to co-editor Charlotte Jacobs. Great, thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here. Greetings everybody from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm sitting here in my office on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education. And I am just so excited to be here for our virtual book launch with my co-editors and with some of our contributors. Um, you know, as Patty was saying, this is Stylus's first ever virtual book launch event. So I love that we get to be pioneers in that way. Um, so this is an exciting time for us. One thing that I wanna make note of is that it's March, it's Women's History Month. And so I feel like it's only appropriate that we are launching our book during this time where we have a month where we're recognizing the achievements uh, and accomplishments of women past and present who are doing amazing work and who are um, recognized for their brilliance and for their fighting against gender fighting against patriarchy and fighting for gender equity. And I feel like our book fits in with that, um, with that theme. And so our book, Investing in the Educational Success of Black Women and Girls is also a celebration of resistance and of black, women's, black women's and black girls' joy. Our book celebrates the many facets of knowledge and resilience that black women and girls possess and enact. And it highlights the way that black girls and women continue to fight against not only sexism, but racism, classism, ableism, and all the other structures in our world that continue to communicate to black girls and women that they are at the margins. And so as we come into this space, I just also wanna um, acknowledge the women, black women and girls who have come before us and whose shoulders we stand on, include, including Audre Lorde here. I have my Audre Lorde earrings on today. Um, to have our ancestors also with us in this space. So in thinking about our book, which I have here, um, our book places the educational experiences of black girls and women at the center by focusing on four different areas of experience. So part one of our book focuses on the notion of mattering for black women and girls in schooling contexts. Part two involves the naming and challenging violence and criminalization that black girls and women experience. Part three takes us to the higher education context and explores how black women and girls navigate the politics and politicization of black women and girls. And part four highlights how black women and girls lift and love on each other in order to survive and to thrive. So I can't wait to share more of our book with you today and what it means to center and to have black girls and women matter um, as we go through the book launch this afternoon. So to give you an overview of the event, First, you will hear from myself and my fabulous co-editors, Dr. Lori Patton and Dr. Venus Evans Winters. And we're gonna give you a bit of our origin story about the book and our work together. And then we will then have a chapter spotlight and a contributor panel where you will get to hear from some of our contributors about their chapters, about their research. And then you as audience attendees will also have the opportunity to ask our contributors questions. So please feel free to put those questions in the chat, um, or you can send a direct message to Dr. V, um, who will be collecting and curating the questions that we can then put to our contributors. 
Something else to highlight in this event is that throughout the event, we are going to have an online raffle. I think that's right. Is that right, Patty? Okay, <laughs> I hope so. Uh, we will have an online raffle going to win a copy of our book. Um, so please sign up using the link and Jasmine will be putting that in the chat so you can keep a lookout for that. Um, we also encourage you to hop on social media throughout this event and tweet or post your takeaways using the hashtag, hashtag Black Girl on Campus and hashtag BGOC Research, which Jasmine will also put in the chat. We would love to have this be a conversation not only in this space, but beyond. Um, and now without further ado, I'm excited to introduce my two co-editors, sister scholars and mentors to you. And I'm gonna have a brief bio for each of them um, before they make their remarks. So first, Dr. Lori Patton is the Department Chair of Educational Studies and Professor of Higher Education and Student Affairs in the College of Education and Human Ecology at The Ohio State University. I'm a proud Ohioan. Uh, Dr. Patton is also the past president of the Association for the Study of Higher Education, also known as ASH, and the co-founder of the hashtag Black Girl on Campus movement. Dr. Venus Evans Winters is a senior researcher at the African American Policy Forum, which is a research and policy think tank developed by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, the godmother of intersectionality theory. In addition to her scholarly work, Dr. Evans Winters is a clinical psychotherapist in private practice and the founder of the Planet Venus Institute. All right, I'm now gonna turn it over to Dr. Lori. All right, uh, hello everybody uh, and welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, um, Charlotte, for the introduction and getting us started. I uh, also want to thank uh, our uh, colleagues and sister scholars who are joining us to participate, all of you in the audience, uh, and thank you to Stylus for this platform. Um, and I think that is a good place to start in terms of how this book came to be. So several years ago, um, there was a, a Stylus book published, uh, it was co-edited, uh, titled Advancing Black Male Student Success from Preschool Through PhD. And I thought it was a really nice volume to help readers think about uh, black boys and men across the educational pipeline, right? And so I'm having this conversation with one of my best friends, uh, Sean Harper. And I'm like, you know, well, where's the work about this, you know, with black girls, you know, or black women? I've seen things in higher ed, I've seen things in K-12, but I feel like there needs to be something that brings that together, right? Uh, and so, uh, admittedly, I had approached some publishers. Stylus wasn't first, uh, and I apologize for that. Uh, and I'm so glad that <laughs> uh, you all were willing to um, uh, uh, allow this platform. But had just been in conversations with other publishers um, about doing some sort of project focusing on um, black girls and women. And I was repeatedly told, well, why not do uh, women and girls of color? Right. And I think that is a very noble and important project. Just not the one I was trying to do at the time. Right. I wanted to specifically focus on black girls and women. And so um, I felt really um, lucky to have the opportunity to be connected with uh, folks at Stylist, John Von Noring. Um, and uh, there was some excitement around the project. And so uh, uh, that's sort of how the actual book came to be, but how this work started, I think has a, a much longer, uh, richer uh, narrative behind it. Um, and so um, in 2016, there was an AERA panel um, titled Black, hashtag Black Girls Matter, public scholarship, um, engaging with the race and gender interactions in school. Uh, I was on that panel. Uh, I remember uh, Venus being in the audience. I remember it being this really great, lively discussion around, you know, black girls in schools. Um, that happened. There were also many of us engaging in this work already, right? Um, uh, doing articles, promoting research. Um, the, imp the impetus also coincided with um, the uh, girls and women, uh, I, now I'm, I'm missing the name, um, 
uh, under the Obama administration, um, focusing on women and girls. And so there were all of these things sort of happening. Um, and I wanted to identify a way to kind of pull in the richness of what we were writing about and what we were learning and how we could share it again across a P20 context. And I knew it was a project that I could not do alone. And so it led to me calling uh, Dr. Venus up and asking her, you know, will you co-edit this book now? We've known each other. We had not collaborated, um, but I couldn't have imagined doing the book without her. Uh, and we were both like, well, hmm, we need somebody else. And so she's like, well, I know somebody who, you know, I just was on her dissertation committee and I think she would be fabulous. And so that happened to be uh, Charlotte. And so we ended up having a conversation, thinking through the book, thinking about, you know, uh, who we would want the contributors to be. And the rest, I'll say, is history, right, uh, in terms of the book's um, uh, presence uh, today. Um, I, I think the most important part about all of this is why we need to continue to engage in scholarship and work that centers uh, Black girls and women. And uh, I think that is most appropriately articulated in the intro of the book, right? The first sentence of that intro is that Black women and girls matter right? It's not why are we studying them or why are we centering? The question is why not, you know? Um, why not do this, right? And so uh, the intro says they matter in communities, they matter in families, in schools, in colleges, and universities. They matter regardless of context. Yet when we talk about their mattering and try to speak them into existence, they're often subjected to erasure. And so this project was not about, you know, um, focusing on erasure. It was about bringing them into the center, highlighting them, illuminating them, uh, and centering them in the work. And the most special part about doing this is being able to engage in this collaborative work with so many other Black women scholars who are um, equally, if not more, committed to this work and um, making and, uh, and continuing to make uh, uh, Black girls and women matter. So thank you all for being here. I will turn Turn it over to um, Dr. Venus. Yeah, Sankofa. I, I feel like we're just like passing the mic, right, in the cipher. And so this is really a Sankofa moment. It's a Sankofa moment because I, I remember this vividly. Uh, and what you were you were talking about, Lori, was the, the state of research on women and girls. Uh, the white, uh, the Obama White House initiative, basically, what is that state of research on black women and girls. And I was one of the people who was invited to the White House to have that discussion. And so I think it was this was before the pandemic. And I think this is an important part of the evolution of the book, because some of the authors might remember uh, this this moment. And let's, I think, Lori, if you can recall, probably the closest this volume gets to that historical impact, the cultural impact in higher ed is probably uh, Sisters of the Academy book. Do you recall that text? Yeah, so it kind of you know brought us in like, oh, this is what we're getting into. And so if you think about where we were at at that time, I think it was probably 2015, 2000, 2016, the state of research on black women and girls. And so when Lori called me, I was like, girl, you know, I'm busy. <laughs> and she was like, yep, yeah, I know, right? And so we said, okay, that's fine. I, I know somebody, right? And it was, I was sitting on Sean Hopper's uh, committee for, who's now Dr. Jacobs, but she was a grad student and Charlotte was also teaching in a, a private school at that time. Uh, and working with black girls and other girls, of course, uh, but she wanted to focus on this research and kind of build off my research on, on resilience and what does that look like now when we talk about, along, uh, about it alongside vulnerability and agency and black femin 
this works in praxis. So that's what Jacob did. She, so this is uh, uh, Charlotte did. So this is like the evolution of that. And if you all remember, thank you for sticking with us because some of y'all remember that AERA presentation, right? And actually, Lori, I was the facilitator. I was the discussion or the chair. I like put it together or something uh, that particular session. And so many of the authors here, many of the women here, they were a part of that presentation. Now, obviously, we couldn't get all the uh, authors uh, at AERA or to present with us, but it started a conversation about what does investment look like for us. And I remember I was thinking too, Lori, we're going to cover pre-K all the way through 22. Now, this should be fabulous, right? <laughs> like, this is going to be an amazing feat. But I think what's really, really important, it shows you the giftedness and the, the fortitude of Black women in the academy. Because remember, in this book, we have activists like Vivian Anderson. We have, you know, we have people who are mothering and daughtering and, you know, caregiving during a pandemic. So that's how long we've been with the book, pre-pandemic and now, po well, we're not post-pandemic, but post, you know, some of the other, uh, you know, racial backlashes and, and et cetera. But nonetheless, and so I think too, when we're talking about investing in black women and girls education, we're talking about investing in people, systems, and individuals. And that's what, that's why when Lori and I both were sitting, I was sitting in my lounge chair, like with my slippers on and my, my snuggie, like, girl, I don't know if we're going to pull this one off. We pulled it off. And we did it with graciousness and we did it with patience. So this book has been a long time coming. So let's think about not just how we invest in our girls, but how do we invest in our women and our community leaders who are doing the work, right? So this text shifts the conversation. We're gonna rethink how we do this investment piece. Great. Thank you, Dr. V and Dr. Lori for your remarks. It was just wonderful to hear the origin story of how this came to be and where we are. And um, before we opened up the room to all the attendees, Dr. V made the remark that this is like a family reunion. So getting to see our different contributors who we've been in contact with for years, getting the book together and now being able to celebrate our accomplishment together is really special. And in terms of my remarks, I feel like I made a lot of them in the opening, but something else that I was thinking about, Dr. V, as you were sharing and talking about investment, is just thinking about how both you and Dr. Lori invested in me and that the process of writing this book and putting this book together um, was the process of investment and recognizing my own, where I am in my own career trajectory and thinking about my own scholarship and the fact that I'm able to build off of your work, Dr. Venus, and your work, Dr. Lori, um, and that you are, you know, as we say, lifting as we climb. So thank you for both of you for your mentorship, um, for your cheerleading, and for thinking of me um, as we put this book together. And then just in terms of the origin story around how Dr. V and I met, AERA is a great place, which is the big education conference for uh, education researchers. I like to call it kind of like the Coachella of academic research. Um, but I saw Dr. V at a presentation for, it was in Philadelphia. I can't remember which year of AERA it was, but when it was in Philadelphia, um, and she was facilitating a panel with Black women scholars who were talking about the state of Black girls in schools. And I had already read her work and I was at the point where I was starting to think about my committee. And so I went up to her and said, hey, I'm Charlotte Jacobs. I'm doing this research. Would you be on my committee? And with zero hesitation, Dr. V just said, yep, just let me know when. <laughs> and just for, for those of you who are not in academia, you know, that doesn't happen very frequently. <laughs> Most of the time it's a process and, you know, you're kind of like dating each other before the person says yes to being on your committee. Um, but the fact that Dr. V took that leap of faith and just said, yep, whatever you need, I, you know, I will be there. So thank you, Dr. V for that. And I'm so glad that our relationship has continued beyond, you know, you being on my committee and you being a person who's really, you know, cheerleading for me and for the other women who are a part of this book. So with that, we are going to move on to um, the next part of our event, which is a chapter spotlight. So first we're going to hear from Dr. Janice Bird and Dr. Krista Porter. Um, they wrote the 
the chapter in our book, Black Undergraduate Women Navigating Misrepresentation, Strength and Strategies. And Dr. Bird is an assistant professor of counselor education at the Pennsylvania State University. And Dr. Porter is an assistant professor of higher education administration at Kent State University. And so the two of them are gonna spend about 12 minutes sharing with you um, their thoughts about their chapter, what their chapter focuses on and um, how they came to, to think about what they want you to take away from, from reading their chapter. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Porter and Dr. Bird. Um, if I can stop grinning, cause I'm fangirling. <laughs> I love being in community with um, black women and black scholars who are committed to um, the work that we do and seeing how we encourage each other and lift each other up. So that has me in a state of um, euphoria. So um, I'm here with my colleague and my sister, scholar sister and um, sister from another mother, um, Dr. Krista Porter. And we, uh, this work is a labor of love um, and connected to a lot of the other work that we were doing. Um, we want to thank the editors for inviting us to contribute this chapter and also the other contributors because we've learned so much from your work. Um, and so we have a brief PowerPoint just so you can read some of the quotes that we're highlighting from our book, but we also have um, um, given you the page number so that you can go and reference them later. So I'll share my screen. And I'll just make this bigger. All right, and so thank you so much for um, Dr. Jacobs for introducing us. And so if you want to capture this, this is our contact information. Um, and so we were just briefly, we won't get into like the nuances of the academy. We just briefly describe what we did. And so this was part of a larger study where we did a critical discourse analysis, which was very much informed by um, Everett and Crooms um, study that they did or published in 2017. So we're very grateful for their work because it guided us where we looked at 35 articles to explore how black undergraduate women experience education. And from that, those um, articles, the constructions um, that came out, there were a total of 11, but we found that these four all kind of um, coalesce around like this idea of wellness and the ways in which they're misrepresented and how it influences these misrepresentations influence uh, many facets of their development. Uh, what we highlight in our chapter is that um, we have so much uh, with Dr. Patton's work, um, Dr. my colleague, uh, my co-presenter, uh, Krista Porter's work, um, higher ed literature when looking at Black women, um, there's a large concentration on how they're doing academically um, how well they're uh, matriculating to their career, um, their identity development. Um, but we wanted to highlight these articles that are looking at how they're doing um, social, socially and emotionally, um, which is an area that we need to explore more. Um, so we're gonna go through like the four um, constructions that we pulled out and pull out some of the quotes. So we can highlight the phenomenal work that people are doing that we were able to pull when we did the critical discourse analysis, which there was a pulling of articles um, that it already exists as well as book chapters. So we'll start with the first one. Good, good, good afternoon, folks. Uh, so good to be with, in community with you all. Uh, Dr. Krista Porter here, she, her pronouns. So I have the pleasure of sharing the first construction uh, being a Black woman is not monolithic experience. We hear this often, uh, but we were able to sort of pull the articles together to really capture what this meant um, as, as far as the discourse, right? So I'll read to you what's on the slide. Uh, we're reading from page 179 for this particular construction. We found it necessary to affirm the various identities highlighted by authors. Example categories for this construction included the intersection of being Black, woman and Muslim in college, a one size fits all approach to being insufficient when meeting the needs of diverse populations, expanding black women's identity to include STEM culture, 
and integrating into engineering as an academic major, causing Black women to redefine their Black womanhood. So just from this quote and this citation on page 179, you see the breadth and depth of Black women's experiences in college, right? It's not just a one sort of, this is what a Black woman looks like and acts like, right? So we pulled in the environment, STEM culture, discipline, uh, folks who were mothers, right? Uh, folks who were at a Hispanic serving institution. And so this is where we get the first construction. Thank you, um, Krista. And so the second construction is one that we see oftentimes across disciplines and it's the cost of being strong. Um, and so I'll read the quote. It says, authors discuss the ways predominantly and historically white educational spaces influence Black women's navigation between being strong Black women and angry Black women archetypes, how strength represented both empowerment and a liability on campus. Messages um, Black undergraduate women received as a part of their gendered racial socialization as Black women, and how the internalization of strength was related to mental wellness problems and strategies. So here, um, the authors of these various um, articles that fell under this construction, they're highlighting that uh, almost like a double entendre of how being strong is both something that um, is a, a, a cloak of resilience, something that can help you um, make it through difficult times, but then also it can render you invisible because people feel as if you're okay. Um, and so we felt like it was important to highlight this, especially since you see so many things in the news around Black women being the most educated group. So those messages give this sense that we're okay, we don't need help. Um, and so we feel like that's something that um, institutions need to be aware of. The third one, it relates to this, is the wellness threats and strategies. So there were several authors that um, provided us feedback or guidance on the things that are threats to one's wellness and strategies that, that the participants in the various studies were already employing to help themselves. And so here I'll read this quote, if I can move the screen, there you go. Example categories for this third construction included um, included the use of intersectionality in all facets of the counseling process, awareness of unique adjustment issues, impact of racial identity and perceptions of body image, and culturally sensitive strategies to maintain mental wellness. Um, Skamansi and Lewis focus on exploring the ways in which Black undergraduate women coped after experiencing discrimination. They determine that coping can result in negative consequences like disengagement, which can disrupt academic success. Um, which gets back to that original statement around how are institutions tailoring their, um, their diversity initiatives to consider these um, peculiar uh, pathways that are paths that Black women, Black undergraduate women navigate um, on college campuses. And then our last construction, maintaining relationships and roles. Um, I'm reading from page 182. Example categories in this first, first construction included familial connections, uh, mothering while in school, and experiences of homelessness while in school. Uh, Kennedy and Winkle Ragnar explored how Black women earn and maintain autonomy while protecting family ties and, pre and determined that these connections are crucial and extractively tied to academic success, right? And so uh, some of the articles talked about birth order, right? Talking about being an older sister, talking about um, being responsible for folks while being homeless, right? Uh, we were able to really capture, again, the diversity and breadth and depth of Black women's experiences and what they were juggling, right? Um, and it really highlighted how uh, the support is absolutely necessary, but also that there's more that we need to investigate when it comes to specific experiences for Black women. So what does this mean? And um, Krista and I were kind of close, uh, close out our talk um, with this, with these two quotes from, I believe they're in the implication section on page 185. Um, 
So we have to remember that when we're, especially now in a lot of academic institutions, particularly um, colleges and universities are attending to the increased mental health needs of their students on campus in various ways. I know here at Penn State, we have a long waiting list, right, for students who need services and there are multiple places where they can get services. So these things present like, first of all, developmentally, um, individuals who are of this age already experience certain things. And then on top of that, um, you know, Black women experience unique cultural things, right? And then now we have COVID that's exacerbating all of those things. So these challenges um, add to their existing level of stress and disrupts one's capacity to cope with gender and our race related threats. Um, and so these things can influence their mental well being, their college engagement, and their academic performance, which we know influences their uh, across their lifespan, their health across their lifespan. And Krista. Yeah, and one thing to add to that is that uh, um, the discourse or the conversations about Black women, while most of them spoke to the undergraduate student experiences, these were Black women across age, right? So we're not talking about sort of the 18 to 24, right? The, we had uh, participants in some of these empirical examinations who were older, right? And so again, back to the construction number one, it's not monolithic, right? And how are we tailoring services and focusing services particular to meet the wellness needs of our, of our, of our students. Um, and so I'll read the last one uh, as we sort of close. Um, as a result, right, so where do we move from here? Okay, future research should explore the lifelong impact of these psychological threats, the experiences of black women who seek help from mental health providers on college campuses, barriers to seeking help, and how counselors are trained to help black women, right? So again, uh, a sort of an institutional responsibility as opposed to just saying, oh, Black women go, we have it here, right? No, what is the cult culture around yeah. seeking help? What is the culture around wellness? Um, and how do we meet the Black women where they are? Thank you, Dr. Bird. I love you. <laughs> Always. I love you too, Dr. Bird. To, to the editor. Uh, and I love you too, Dr. Bird. Editors, we are so appreciative. Appreciate y'all. Yes, and thank you. Thank you both Dr. Bird, Dr. Porter for kicking this off. Um, the way that you lifted up the voices of the women who you worked with and also highlighting how the Black women ex woman experience is not a monolithic experience is something for all of us to take to heart and particularly just thinking about how our different intersectional identities create then unique experiences that we have on college campuses. Um, I want to give folks in the audience a chance to ask the two of you questions uh, before we move on to our panel. So if you in the audience, if you would like to um, ask a little bit more about Dr. Byrd and Dr. Porter's work and their chapter, you can feel free to put your question in the chat or you can direct message Dr. V. Dr. V, are, are there any questions? Yes, we do have one question. Uh, I'm not sure if it was for uh, you, Dr. Patton, or myself, or even for Drs. Porter and Bird. But the question was, how do we continue to do the work? How do we continue to uh, lift up girls? And the person who asked the question was saying that they work in an MSI institution. Um, and so they were just wondering, how do we continue to lift as we climb, so to speak? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, so. I, I'm new to Penn State, and so um, immediately I've been in community with Black women and acknowledging the, the issues that they're facing here, uh, much like at my previous institutions. And so in the work that I'm doing, and it's very similar to, I think, um, some of the work that's doing done in K-12 settings in reference to including the Black women and the Black girls in the process of identifying um, what's harming them, but also being someone, I'm in a position not of power. I never say I have power, but I have influence. So I sit at tables and I can influence decisions and influence things. So when they speak about the issues that they're facing, I know the system a little better than they do. So I take that information and I use my influence to talk about 
we need to bring about change. How can we bring about change in this way? Um, and oftentimes that means being in community with other Black women on campus that also have influence so that we can work together. So it's create, not only creating the space where they, they share their trauma stories, right? Oh, this bad thing happened to me, but also letting them know that this is a space that we can also use what you're sharing to influence change. And even if you don't see the change, maybe it influence change for other Black women that come after you. Thank you, uh, James. The only thing I'll add is for the particularly around a higher ed context, um, there's, I mean, we can read literature pieces, scholarship after scholarship, and most often all of them say Black women need space, Black women need time together, Black mean, women need mentoring, they need folks who look like them. But yet the actual enactment of that um, is scarce. Right. So how often are institutions uh, and folks on campus providing spaces or um, uh, sort of helping create spaces where black women can just be, um, you know, how often do collaborations happen between women's resource centers and black cultural centers right at the intersection of who these women are right yeah. between LGBT and gender source centers right. Um, and so actually allowing black women to create their own spaces, but yet helping them shepherd right through the process so that means putting money towards. Uh, these spaces, the facilitation of these spaces. And so just asking ourselves and doing some sort of campus audit of what do these, what can these spaces look like and how are we really um, sort of petu perpetuating the, the need for dialogue and the spaces that the Black women are asking for over and over and over again. And, and I, I think Krista and Janice, I, I do, I love that. And I want to ask uh, Dr. Lori Patton if she can also speak to that question, because I think that when it comes to, uh, you know, longevity in the game, she can see, you know, the the, the long view, because we do some, you know, so I'm, I'm going to let Dr. Pat answer that. But before we go on, Dr. Ford, who's a colleague of Dr. Patton Davis over at OSU also asked about racial identity formation. And I think in this case, that's appropriate because you all do SEO work and, and counseling and work in counseling spaces. So you all, can you talk about how racial identity formation relates to Black women's resiliency and, and um, tenacity in these spaces? I'll let Krista uh, uh, address that and then I'll, I'll respond to the question you uh, posed. Yeah, so absolutely. I've created a model, right? And it's had uh, various reconceptualizations of what it means for, particularly at the undergraduate level, but it looks across the lifespan where they really talk about what sort of personal foundations they've created from the grandmas and the aunties and the sisters and those who were in their life and what who were the models of what a black woman should be and should act like right and so it really talks about the influence of interactions um, from very a very young age it talks about the interactions in the classroom it talks about interactions with faculty and counselors and, and how all of those experiences with the backdrop of those mamas and aunties and sisters, right? Um, help them articulate better who they are, but it also pulls in media and mentors, right? And so um, it sort of talks about the dissonance that black women undergraduates have going through college um, and developing, right? And their ability to then articulate who they are and who they want to be moving forward. So absolutely all that is tied um, into this conversation. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Yeah, and I would add to it um, on the counseling side and mental well-being is that when you look at the history of Black psychology, uh, many Black psychologists have been saying for a very long time that there's um, mental wellness is very strongly connected to um, cultural congruence. So this um, and also critical consciousness. So I think of like the groups that I'm creating now, um, there's this element, um, especially around race-based trauma, that critical consciousness has to be there. So there's aware, an awareness of who you are and also an awareness of how you navigate these social con constructs um, in the, the space and how you look and who you are. Um, so that consciousness helps you become aware that you are not the problem, but the system is a problem. Because a lot of people who don't understand that, they're, they're walking around thinking, oh, if I change myself, if I just do my hair differently, then there's this constant trying to morph yourself, but really you can never do it because you're a black woman. 
Um, and I, just to respond to the question, uh, uh, Venus um, put out there uh, around longevity and uh, sustaining and lifting. I think the the thing that's coming to mind for me is the work by uh, Sharon Freeze Britt and Bridget Turner Kelly about retaining uh, each other, um, how black women do that. And I will say I would not be where I am today had it not been for uh, investments in me, you know, and not just by black women, but there was a certain way. I, I don't know if there isn't a way, I can't, it's hard to um, articulate, but um, having black women speak things into me that I hadn't, you know, considered for myself. You know, and I, I think a lot about my my mentor, uh, Mary Howard Hamilton, who said, you need to be a faculty member while I was trying to be a vice president of student affairs. Um, or um, uh, what I've tried to do for uh, peers who, who've who uh, gone through the process alongside me and other women in the field. I just, I think it's possible to do this work in a way that doesn't feed into competition in the academy. Like we can all, you know, be rising together. Um, and I don't know, something about that helps me. Uh, and so I guess for selfish reasons uh, to retain myself, um, it's important to be in community with black women, whether it's, in, you know, through scholarship and writing or, you know, in other ways, but to continue to do that, like that has been consistent throughout my career. Um, I am more proud of the work I've done in collaboration with black women than any, you know, any other thing I've done. And so I don't know, I, I, I know what it feels like to be erased. I know what it feels like to be silenced. Um, and to the extent that I can be a possibility model or a role model or resource and all of those things, that's what I'm, you know, uh, seeking to do. Um, and uh, there are lots of black women doing this. So in that regard, I don't feel like I'm unique um, in any particular way. Um, I don't know if that actually answers the question, but um, I mean, it's part of who I am, but also part of um, the passion I have for this kind of work uh, because it just literally irritates my soul when people leave black women out, um, but expect us to, you know, carry, uh, carry the load um, without the resources, without the love, without the care and all of those pieces. And I think, we're able to thrive and survive by caring for one another. Yeah, thank you. And I just wanted to respond to um, my cousin, Carolyn, who asked the question, do you address generational curses felt by young ladies? And I think, um, cousin Carolyn, I'm interpreting what you're saying, but I think what you're talking about is the intergenerational trauma that um, Dr. Porter and Dr. Bird were talking about. and. I think building off of what you were saying, Dr. Bird, about um, the importance of developing a critical consciousness, that's something that I think about in my own work, about how important it is for Black girls to be able to see how power relations work and kind of where they are positioned within the power structures that are in our society and how they push back and resist against that. And particularly, um, my chapter in this book focuses on the development of emotional literacy. So how can you have a critical conscious lens as you're developing your emotions and thinking about recognizing what you feel and knowing that what you feel as a black girl is okay. And also being able to develop that lens to understand how other people may be viewing your emotions. So right, the, the stereotype of the angry black girl or people thinking that when black girls are at a level three, they're at a level 10 or the research that's out there about adultification and black girls not getting as much care around their emotions because they're seen as being older than they actually are. And so I think that part of our work and what we're doing is we're naming it, which is important. And then something I didn't say before, but another part of each chapter is that we have a set of discussion questions and we also have other resources that we as contributors have found to be really valuable in thinking about our research. And so that's another way that we're hoping this book moves forward the conversations to support black girls and women in these different educational contexts by having dialogues around the different themes and ideas that we present in the book. So, and so Charlotte, I'm so glad you all need to check out Charlotte's dissertation and she has later work 
Uh, I was on her committee. I'm not biased. I was minding my own business, Dr. Patton. I was minding my own business doing a workshop, a, a webinar yesterday. And they said, oh, so Dr. Evans Winters, can you please speak on emotional literacy? And I thought I was at her dissertation defense. I did read her dissertation. And so, uh, but anyway, so I do know a lot about, uh, you know, Dr. Jacobs work on emotional literacy and we should all read it, not just for the content, it's a great dissertation manuscript. I know she's published since then, right? Including in this book, but go back to that. Uh, refer your students to that. It, and if you work with, with girls in middle schools or high schools, you definitely want to look at that model on emotional literacy. And I'm glad that I knew it like the back of my hand because Dr. Beer Jacobs, I wasn't ready for that question. <laughs> so you're going to get a lot of uh, people tweeting you. I can tell you that right now. Okay, so thank you for addressing emotional literacy. Thanks so much for the love, Dr. B. And I think we're gonna continue this love fest now. We're gonna move on to our panelists so that you can hear more about the different ideas that come up in our book around supporting black girls and women. So I'm first gonna introduce our panelists and then I have three questions that I'm going to ask them and then we will open it up to the audience for Q&A. So feel free throughout the remarks that the panelists are making as they answer the questions, feel free to put your questions in the chat or to direct message Dr. V. So our first panelist is Dr. Dorothy Hines and she holds a joint appointment as an assistant professor in the Department of African and African-American Studies in the School of Education at the University of Kansas. In our book, Dr. Hines co-authored a chapter that is titled Unprotected and Left for Dead educational policy and the nobodiness of black girls disciplined through suspension and school related arrests. Our next panelist is Dr. Monique Lane. She is a proud mama and an associate professor of educational leadership at St. Mary's College in California. And her chapter is titled Toward a Politicized Ethic of Care about Black Women and Girls in Education. Dr. Tiffany Steele is an assistant professor of education at Oakland University. Her chapter is titled Staying Out of the Way, Connecting Black Girls' Experiences with School Discipline to Collegiate Experiences. Our next panelist is Dr. Takia Robinson, and she is an Associate Director of Research and Policy in the Office of Undergraduate STEM Education at the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And her co-authored chapter is titled Still Retaining Each Other, Black Women Building Community Through Social Media and Other Digital Platforms. And our final panelist is Dr. Erin Corbett, who runs a community-based educational nonprofit organization, Second Chance Educational Alliance, which provides justice-impacted students a pathway to bachelor's degrees in business administration in partnership with Southern New Hampshire University. So welcome to all of you. Um, we're excited to have you here. And my first question is related to the title of our book. So our book is called Investing in the Educational Success of Black Women and Girls, and would love to hear from you all what that means to you. So what does it mean to invest in Black women and girls, and what does it look like? And so feel free to jump in, and we'll just make space for each other. I'll jump in first. I'll be I'll be the first to the fight. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Jacobs. I really appreciate it. The uh, the work that I do, um, very much as a practitioner, sort of moonlighting as a researcher, sometimes really focuses on justice impacted people as a whole. Um, being invited to write this chapter allowed me to kind of push that focus, you know, back to K-12 a little bit to really kind of piece together what we all kind of know anecdotally as the um, school to prison pipeline, but to look really a little bit more in depth um, into how that impacts Black girls. And what I found and what I think we all know is that very largely as much as education is sort of the pathway of social mobility in a lot of ways, it is also a trap for Black girls. Um, our young black girls are adultified. And so as another sister was mentioning, you know, when they're on level three, someone thinks they're on level 10. And so when they're being disciplined in these K-12 environments, whether, they're, whether there's a school resource officer, a cop in the school or not, they are disciplined for things that are not even disciplinable, really uh, offenses, right? So we're, we're talking about 
insubordination. We know what that looks like on our, on our Black girls. We know that insubordination looks like a Black girl sticking up for herself. It looks like a Black girl sticking up for someone else in her class. It looks like a Black girl who is confident in herself, who is sure of herself, who is not going to take any mess from anybody because that's what she's been taught, right? That's what insubordination starts to look like um, for our young black girls when you start to factor in discussions about hair, discussions about family structure and how family structure and potential um, drama and trauma in that family structure can impact how they show up to school, we then start to see how faculty, how administration, how law enforcement also then pounces on these children, um, on our Black girls, in ways that are simply not helpful. They are assigned to um, lower levels of classes. We all know that in high school, our Black girls are not always given the same opportunities for those AP classes, those you know elevated IB courses. Um, and so we just see this consistent path from literally like five years old to 18 where Black girls are just routinely and repeatedly beat down, sometimes physically, and we've seen those videos um, recently as well. They are beat down by a system that does not want them there, and yet they still persist, and yet we still persist. But it was so um, just telling to see how these systems, law enforcement, education, how they collude in the K through 12 and how that extends into a young black woman's adulthood, especially if she has been justice impacted. If she has had contact with a school resource officer or law enforcement in K-12, there is an increased likelihood that she will have uh, contact with law enforcement as an adult. Again, not because she is, you know, a person who needs to be in touch with law enforcement, but because that's how these systems track and that's how they work. And so when we have young women who have been involved in the K-12 system and law enforcement situations there who are, who may become incarcerated, they're now for the most part um, cut off from educational opportunities unless those opportunities are to complete secondary education. Um, as we've seen recently, higher ed in prison or offering college courses in prison has become more popular. It has become more trendy um, to talk about it. It has become cool to be in support of it. So now everybody wants to do it. And the group, I'm gonna let you guess which group of potential students gets left out of these conversations. Don't worry, I'll wait, it's black women. Right, because women make up 10% or less than 10% of the incarcerated population, the programs that are available to them, if they are available in large part, are um, more domestically oriented. So if we think of a state like Texas, um, the, the educational opportunities that are provided to the women who are incarcerated there are, you know, home ec and child rearing and and these things are necessary I, and i'm not meaning to negate the importance of these pieces but you then if you look at some of the programs that are available to incarcerated men in texas there are all kinds of trades there are more um post-secondary opportunities available to men than there are to women and so again it is a very clear disparity and a lack of interest or attention being paid to the Black women who are in this carceral system, who are often desperately trying to get out and find ways to leverage education um, to, to a better life. Great. Thanks so much, Erin. And I'm actually going to bump it over to Dr. Hines, because I know that your research builds off of what Dr. Corbett was just describing. Yeah, I think one of the the things that stood out to me with this book is the notion of investing. And so when you invest, like with the stock market or anything in particular, you're looking for a return on something because you know there's value there. And I think that's the point that stood out to me the most is in schools, we don't see Black girls as having value. So they're not investable. We don't think we're going to get anything in return. So why put money? Why put a curriculum that's girl-centered and that focuses on Black girls, why focus on the community? Because again, we have this mindset that to invest in something means that for Black girls, there's nothing we will get in return because they are nothing of value. And so in the chapter 
um, me and Dr. Uh, Evans Winters uh, co-wrote, it talks about this notion that Mark Lamont Hill brings up is nobodies. So what does it mean not just to be seen as uh, not human, but to be seen as a nobody? Think about that. To be seen as a nobody to sit in a chair, to hear a teacher talk to you, to hear a teacher argue with you, to be you know, picked up by school resource officers, to be told over and over and shown you're a nobody. That's a painful space to be in. It's very painful space. And I can even recall some of my experiences going through elementary school. I was the one, oh, I was written up all the time and sent to the office. My parents had to go all the time <laughs> to talk about what their daughter can and cannot do. And so for me, this idea of investing doesn't just mean that I see you, but I place value on you. And for a lot of girls, Black girls, we see pre-K through the prison system, through detention centers, through foster care facilities, they are seen and treated as nobody. The second thing I will say when we talk about investing, we have to talk about the need to divest from certain things that we're doing. And so we have to change what we're doing in the curriculum. We have to change and alter not just our mindset, but also the policies and practices, those structural conditions that really make it saturate through all elements of the education system. So I don't want to just invest in you and say, I see value, while at the same time, I have this deficit-oriented thinking that says, but you still are nobody. I can give your school extra money for the curriculum, for school funding, but I can still treat you as a nobody. And so for me, again, to invest means that I see you of value. And for so many girls, I work with uh, girls um, in Lawrence, Kansas. And so the Midwest is very different than a lot of parts of <laughs> the United States of America. And so I hear the same thing from girls over and over. They see me, but they don't see me. I'm invisible, I'm a nobody. But you see me when I mess up, but you don't see my brilliance. You see me when I forgot to do something in class that you said this, this ritual that I should show you that this is what a smart or effective student is. But at the same time, you're the first one to write me up and send me out. You're the first one to say, no, we need to have intervention by a school resource officer or even call the police when this could have been solved through a conversation. And so, yes, I think for me, investing means seeing someone of value, changing the policies and practices that we have around suspensions, expulsions. Obviously, many states like California have passed a moratorium on suspensions, but it also has to be coupled with divesting from certain things that we do to say that we're actually providing for all students, but we're actually leaving Black girls out of the conversation. And that part. And so as I was, I was actually, I, I got distracted because I'm trying to tell Aaron, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, woo, -wee, woo. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be uplifting questions. But then uh, another one of my uh, muses, uh, you know, Dorothy Hines, Dr. Hines, she gets on, right? And I'm like, We're, these, com these are in conversation. So what, what Aaron and Dorothy is talking about is in conversation with. And so uh, Dorothy and I, we did co-author this chapter and we have some other presentations and publications. And I just want to remind y'all because I saw the chat was like, whoo, this is what I call Negro politics in education. So what Dr. Lamont Hill refers to as nobodies, what we're now talking about is systems because y'all cite a black woman, cite a black woman, yeah. Okay, all right, invest, <laughs> invest in our literacies and our intellectual labor. <laughs> and so what we're talking about, Negro politics is a type of intellectual warfare that governments impose in on the colonized. So as you can imagine, whether it's what, what Dr. Corbett is saying, you're talking about the state investing in prisons, the state, because you, you, public education is a state agency. It's the arm of the state. 
okay? So state-sanctioned violence, it will turn you, the state turns you into nobodies, but what if I told you all that was intentional warfare? What if I told you to see our girls being dragged and punched in the face by adult white men is strategy? as warfare? What if I told you it was a curriculum? And so these two chapters are definitely, because we're not, we're not trying to teach our girls or our young women to adapt to the violence. We're not trying to teach them to sit in the pain or the trauma. We're trying to teach the adults and the young people, what if we told you all that we were at war intellectually and culturally. So nobody's means that they're being dehumanized. The curriculum is dehumanizing. It's justifying other violence. And so I'm gonna leave it there. I'm gonna pitch back out to Charlotte. So I just wanted you all to know how these can be in conversation. And also I would like to uplift the question uh, that's coming for me. We have Dr. Davis back. Thank you, uh, Lori, for coming back. I thought we lost you for a minute. I was getting nervous. And, and I just want us to start thinking about, too, I want you to know everybody here, and I'm hoping, Dr. Lane, you can speak to this and Dr. Steele as well. We're not conflating girls with women. I want to be clear. And we're also not excluding our non-binary youth and, and, and adults, okay? I want to be clear uh, but we unapologetically, and, and actually Lori taught me this, we unapologetically center Black girls and Black women while also being ex inclusive, but unabashedly committed to this, you know, centering Black girls, women, and non-binary youth, okay? So we're not conflating the two, and I'll let Dr. Wayne speak to that at some point as well as, as, well as Dr. Steele, because this is their body of work as well. Pitching it back out to you, Charlotte. <laughs> and I'm going to pitch it right over to Dr. Lane. Yes. Uh, <laughs> investment, investing in Black girls and women. What does that mean to you? And where have you seen, how have you um, leaned into that in your own research? Yeah. Well, first of all, I just have to say I am so hyped <laughs> and so honored to be in community with all of y'all today, I can barely contain my joy. I'm not going to contain it, honey. We're going to hold space for joy today as well. But I do want to say just before I start, I do want to just say thank you so much to the editors and just to everyone in the audience for um, having me, for having us, and just for lifting up Black women and Black girls. So, um, well, so the, the first thing that I think about, honestly, when I think about investment and Black women and girls is really exactly what we're doing today. Loving um, Black women and girls enough to center um, our experiences, to center our perspectives, our collective wisdom. I think that when we invest in Black women and girls, we protect them to get at what other folks were saying on the panel as well, right? We honor the beautifully multifaceted expressions of their humanity, like Dr. V was mentioning. So I'm talking about celebrating cisgender and transgender and gender nonconforming and LGBT, LGBTQIA plus black women and girls and also black women and girls with compromised citizenship statuses and, um, and or learning or physical complexities, right? So true um, investment, I think, means that we honor, we celebrate and we show up for our community as a whole. So, um, but there's, I think, more to it that I think about. So I'm a former high school English teacher. I uh, taught at my alma mater in South LA for many years. Um, and there's something else that comes to mind for me when I think about investing in Black women and, and girls from a from a practitioner's perspective. And I talk about this in depth in, in my recently released book, which is titled Engendering Hashtag Black Girl Joy, How to Cultivate Empowered Identities and Educational Persistence in Struggling Schools. So what I thought about um, a lot in, in my research, in my work with young Black women is the urgent need for classroom teachers to develop courage, and the Black feminist practice of risk-taking, an ethic of risk-taking. And so what I mean by that is 
practitioners must take up disruptive dispositions. What does it mean to be disruptive um, as a practitioner and, and challenge culturally irresponsible, violent curriculum and pedagogies? And, and that means, as others have already mentioned, critically analyzing and disrupting their own deficit ideologies about Black girls and about Black women that limit these students' ability to thrive, right? And certainly limits their ability to survive in these, in these schools. So along those lines of disruptive dispositions, I think that investing in Black women and girls also means silencing our egos. And I talk about this in the book because it's something that I had to do, right? Silencing our egos and uh, as educators and positioning our students, positioning black girls and women as leaders and as change agents within classrooms and within educational settings because they know what they want and need and can benefit from in schools, right? So what does it look like? This is my question to, that I ask myself, my question that I pose to y'all. What does it look like to cultivate, to amplify, honey, to delight in Black women and girls' wisdom, to truly um, invest in them? I think, again, from the stance of a, of a classroom practitioner, means showing up for them as co-conspirators, um, co-creating learning communities where they can feel safe to celebrate uh, their collective knowledge and to heal together and to access shared moments of vulnerability, right? What does it mean to co-construct spaces with Black girls so they can craft their own political agendas, all right, about their intersectional and uh, social and academic identities, like the great Audrey Lord said, one of my favorite quotes ever, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive, right? So we must create opportunities for Black women um, and girl learners to develop internally defined definitions of themselves um, and collectively speak truth to power within these institutions. So that's what I think we need more of educators with disruptive dispositions who are constantly, because it is an ongoing struggle to interrupt these systems and interrupt these ideologies and interrupt these discourses that perpetuate and give rise to school-induced trauma, right? We've got to interrupt it. That's a, a big piece of um, investing. Thank and you. I'm trying to get Dr. Monique Lane's links to her latest book. I am the uh, series editor for her book, so sorry, but we're going to drop those links soon. Uh, we do want that book on cultivating joy. And I think it's important because I think there's this myth, uh, Charlotte, that we only do like research in higher ed. And I think it's important uh, you know, for people to know that people like Dr. Monique Lane and some of the, you know, the rest of, of the authors are, were actually classroom practitioners like, like Dr. Jacobs. Uh, so I think that's important to have insight from the field, uh, so to speak. So thank you, Dr. Lane. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. Yes. And Dr. Lane, when you could put the link to the, to your book in the chat, I'm sure there are many people, including myself, who want to read it. So thank you. Um, and I'm going to, I pitch it over to Dr. Steele to talk a little bit more about investment. Oh, well, hey, everyone. Um, I'm over here a ball of nerves because of the amount of excitement, the amount of like just gratitude I feel to be in this space and to see people that I literally cited and read their work cover to cover, <laughs> you know, to structure my dissertation and give my start. This is just amazing. So I'm gonna try not to stammer and uh, be a long winded and have a tangent. Um, but also, I would just be awful if I didn't say thank you, Dr. Lori Patton Davis, number one, for inviting me to even contribute to this book in a way, but then also being the first person to just sit me down and say, 
you need to start typing. <laughs> so thank you so much. Because I don't know if that dissertation would have got started without you. So, <laughs> um, But when thinking about what does it look like to invest in Black girls and women, my remarks are more towards higher education institutions and just educational institutions in general, because I feel like a lot of the conversations I've had uh, related to research about Black girls and women and what it looks like to invest in them um, I'm always in a room and it's not, it doesn't look like this, right? Where like, this is the space of like preaching to the choir where I feel like we are all on the same page. We are on the same wavelength. We are understanding all these different things that black girls are experiencing and then how it impacts their transition into black womanhood. Um, but in these other spaces, that's not always <laughs> readily seen. And so my remarks are more about First, just to Dr. Uh, Venus's point, like institutions need to do a better job of distinguishing the fact that black girls and women are two separate populations overall, right? Like the, even the way that we conceptualize research, even the way that in higher education, we talk a lot about black collegiate women um, to, again, to Dr. Pat and Davis's credit, I had issue in my dissertation, even thinking about writing um, black college women because I was working with my participants and I'm like, these are like my little sisters. These are like, these are like babies. And so if I add into that adultification by saying they're black college women um, and her okay, amazing wisdom, of course, to say, well, why don't you just ask them what they want to be called? <laughs> I was like, great point. Um, and so leading into that space of, you know, even when we're engaging in research, but also engaging with these institutions, we can still provide Black girls agency to self-define, um, but also push forward this conversation around hey, institutions do a better job of acknowledging these girls or women where they are versus trying to tell them where they should be and then placing these societal pressures on them based off the identity you just placed on them. Um, the other thing I was thinking about is just that simply institutions just need to put their money where their mouth is, specifically higher education institutions. We've seen a lot of these DEI initiatives and strategic plans and all these different things coming out, right? And it sounds really good. It sounds really great. You know, you can see it on the website, but when it comes down to what it looks like practically on the actual grounds that is supported by an institution and not by a room of Black women like this or Black women students who are using their extra labor and energy to do things to retain themselves, right? Institutions need to really put money towards resources, right? We can find money for everything else. We can find money for a new building. We can find money for a new VP. We can find money for all these other things, but it needs to be some money towards these resources that are specifically for Black girls and women. Um, I can't even think about as my time as a graduate student, um, similar to the point that, uh, again, Dr. Pat was making earlier about folks I'm advocating for leadership, um, leadership programming and spaces for Black women students specifically. And the um, DEI office basically saying, but how can we broaden it and make it women of color, like leadership for women of color? In my graduate student space, I didn't feel necessarily the power to say, that's not who I'm talking about. I don't want to do that, <laughs> right? But trying to even just thinking like, I have to just go along with this so at least the black girls still have this space right to do some some of this work and this development that isn't always afforded to them um and then last is just making space for black women to just be um i've learned from my own experiences i've learned from my participants and continuously like just learning from black women colleagues i'm in relationship with is that the labor never stops right and the labor starts in childhood right and so it's like a condition of like okay when I'm in these spaces I have to prove my value so I have to contribute in some way and it's usually an overperformance right we are usually like worried about being on our a game when other folks are at the c game they're not even trying like you know so we're like really super worried and holding ourselves to these super high standards when honestly I had to tell my friend the other day like girl like Somebody else's tuxedo is literally the bottom of your shoe. That's how great you are. Just, 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 just naturally, right? So like, how do we make space for black women and girls to just be so they can actually reflect and focus on themselves about this, uh, 
this self-definition around what success will mean for them specifically without the context of these societal pressures that are trying to tell them like, no, this is what success is. This is what you should be aiming for. Um, yeah, you need to do that extra work. You need to do that extra labor. When it's like, no, you need to focus on the things that you want to do, right? Because that's where the work and the things that we actually need in this society will come from. Because we know Black women have been putting in the work anyways. So now it's just time to make space so that they can continue to do that work um, outside of just this laborist thing and battling all the other barriers and tensions that they can face in the educational system overall. Thank you, Dr. Steele. And we have, we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to cut down my questions. I'm going to ask one more question to the group um, before we open it up for Q&A from the audience. And so this next question is thinking about, you know, the fact that we created this book to say, here is the research that we've done so far about Black women and girls in these educational contexts. And, you know, this is a book is a moment in time. And so the question I have for you all is thinking about what questions do we still need to be asking? Where is the direction of the research on Black women and girls, particularly in the field of education, where should it be going? Um, and who should be involved and what should we be asking? So. I'm gonna start off with Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I have really enjoyed uh, the opportunity to sit here and just take in all of the wisdom and brilliance and uh, just the intellectual, amazing contributions of all of the women on this panel, all of the contributors of this book, to the editors. I really wanna thank you all. Um, I'm really excited to answer this question because I feel like, um, so, so my, the, the chapter that I had the opportunity to co-author with my colleague, uh, Dr. Brittany Williams, was about um, uh, digital counter spaces or the ways in which um, Black women have been using social media and the internet to, to create spaces um, of support and encouragement and accountability. And we looked at um, five of these spaces through the lens of uh, Sharon Friesbrett and Bridget Turner Kelly's uh, still retaining each other framework, um, you know, just sort of, you know, to the point that has been made uh, many times, you know, we've been doing this work for a long time. There is a um, unpublished sort of curriculum that Black women have to navigate, and we don't, it's not written down anywhere, but we just know how to get each other through. And so um, the internet has, has expanded that work even more. And um, I think that that's the wave and that's where we're headed um, because, you know, especially in light of COVID and in light of, uh, you know, shutdowns, you know, many of us were confined and cut off from the communities that we crave, the communities that sustain us, the communities that empower us, spaces just like this. And the internet has really been an awesome space for Black women who have um, taken time to cultivate community and build and build infrastructure for you know writing groups and and um, mentoring circles and you know networking spaces. Um, um, resourceless uh, when when um dr uh v, dr v said earlier about sight of black women there are whole uh you know databases out there where all of we can publish our own things and if you're looking for a citation um i think i think that there black women like us have have been really uh intentional about creating these digital counter spaces um and it was just a, a privilege to be a part of that of that work and thinking about, I think, in terms of where we're headed, I think that there's a call for us to reimagine and sort of, uh, you know, think bigger when we think about what counts as scholarship, what counts as academic discourse, what counts, what are the, um, and not limiting our conversations to solely conventional academic spaces like scholarly journals. Um, you know, two of the spaces that we highlight in our chapter were podcasts. Um, we also highlighted, you know, other sort of community groups. And so I think that this podcasting, these spaces, um, is, is awesome opportunities for our research dissemination, research translation. I have a, a very, uh, I have a podcast, Getting Grown is going to be five. We've been, we've been um, doing podcasts for over five years, well, just five years on March 27th, we'll celebrate our fifth anniversary. And in the beginning, I thought that 
you know, I was going to have a podcast with one of my sister friends and it was going to be like a passion project on the side. But as I've sort of grown in my own scholarship and as a professional and a practitioner, I'm recognizing there's synergy. I'm recognizing that a lot of the ways in which I publish um, resources and tools um, in the field as an educator, you know, there's space and a lane being created in social media and through the digital platforms for that for that work as well. And it's really just come in full circle because I don't even know, I guess just in the way of sharing, um, uh, Dr. Patton has been on, on my podcast and I remember speaking to her in the beginning. I also had a conversation with Dr. V. I don't know if you remember, but we were together at the CREA conference and I mentioned to you that I were going to start a podcast and feeling shame, like, you know, wondering how other academics were going, were they going to think that I was less of an academic because I had a podcast or was this going to water down? Were people not going to take me seriously? Was this going to be an attack on my credibility? And honestly, um, you know, just like Dr. Patton was saying, women have spoken into her, both she and Dr. V spoke into me. And I still wrote down one of the things that Lori said on my show to think about every podcast as a publication. And when I think about the conversations that we've been able to have, and when I think about the doors that have been able to be open and the spaces we've been able to curate and cultivate that illuminate the labor and intellectual contributions of Black women and Black girls, um, I, I am I am awe inspired, and I really think that's the direction that we're headed in. And I'm really excited. I think there's lots of possibility out here. What are the ways that we can think about translating our research beyond journals and books chapters, beyond um, resource guides? What are the ways that we can 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 also empower to uh, to Dr. Lane's point? We're co-constructing. What are the ways that we can amplify the voices of the people that we are studying and serving and elevating them up? And you know, my mind has been blown by the doors that that the podcasting world has opened to me. And so I, I'm hoping that as a field, we can start to move in that direction. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. And as you were talking, people have been dropping in the chat um, references to different podcasts and to different hashtags. Um, just as you said, so we can broaden the conversation that's happening and bring it outside of academia and to give more people access to the conversations about supporting women and girls. Um, are there other panelists who would like to share? Where do you think the direction of research for Black women and girls should be going? What questions should we be asking? I could go really quickly because mine, again, I have lists because I was like, uh-uh, you go tangent, girl. Mm -mm. So uh, <laughs> really quickly, um, Thinking about, well, as being an emerging like scholar in the field, a lot of the questions are questions I plan to ask um, and I'm currently asking. Um, and so just thinking about uh, first off, what are some of those collective factors uh, to Dr. Porter's point earlier that assist black girls in developing um, into black womanhood, but also making that own definition for themselves about what they see womanhood as versus feeling like there may be some models out there that they have to follow um, with the potential that that model may not be the most positive or the most healthy for them. Um, and then just thinking about when we do think about Black girls transitioning into womanhood, how do we capture that transition and that experience of that transition of moving um, out and then into womanhood and then what is that called and so thinking about just black girls as emerging adults and giving them access to what abilities or what um, what kind of grace society gives emerging adults typically right the expectation that they will make mistakes that things they're growing and they're changing right we talk about adultification Black collegiate girls, even if they are starting early, I remember Dr. Uh, Layla McLeod mentioning that she started college when she was like 16 or 17. So for folks to be referencing her as like a woman all the time, it was very jarring. And so thinking about how do we make space for that and viewing Black girls, even if they are in collegiate spaces as emerging adults and giving them back that grace that society has basically taken from them since they've been in education. Um, and then just thinking about overall, um, in those transitions, 
one question that keeps coming up for me, um, even when I write my like my work, but also thinking about future projects, is what happens to those girls who just leave the educational pipeline, right? And we we usually focus on the girls who are in the schools, who are going to colleges, who are going to different trades or vocational spaces. But what happens to those girls who just say this isn't for me because I've experienced too much trauma and harm here? And like, how do we get their stories? How do we actually talk about how they found methods of success outside of degree attainment um, and also acknowledging that success is valid? Like they don't have to have this degree for us to talk about them and view them as successful. Um, so those are the things that I think we need to explore. And how about those professors who say, this ain't for me, <laughs> this is traumatizing, <laughs> this is sad. This is hard. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of them. So thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll talk offline too. <laughs> yes. I have a thought there too. Can I add? Do we have time? Yeah, you have time, and then we're, we'll go to the audience. We'll take a couple of questions. Okay, cool. I'll talk fast because okay. so there there are two areas of research that have certainly like been explored, but I would like to come across um, these areas more often. First and foremost, I want to see more scholarship that's a big up to Black women and our legacy as dope ass educators. Okay. <laughs> so, what I mean by that is like, I would love for future just research to further conceptualize. And my work is a part of this conversation um, as well, but there is a huge legacy of this, right? So I, I want to see research that conceptualizes and interprets and uh, elucidates the pedagogies of exemplary Black women educators in a manner that um, helps to inform the practices of all teachers and then disseminate that information widely. And so I say that because uh, black women, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but we are often violently excluded from discourses about anti-racist and humanizing and, you know, liberatory pedagogies. But the research has continuously, like, documented how Black girls cite Black women teachers as transformative educators, as role models, right, as inspirational forces in their lives. So the first thing that I would like to see is more um, research that documents and that honors the legacy of the work that we do. Um, and then secondly, and, and this is a big one that um, I'm sure many of us are affected by, um, myself included, um, there is a well-documented um, propensity for burnout among Black women teachers specifically and, and educators of color in general, but especially with the return to in-person schooling, um, the confluence of the lingering effects of this pandemic and ongoing state-sanctioned murders of Black people, of Black women, our Black women and girl learners um, and their families and communities are struggling many of us, and schools absolutely need to step up as a sanctuary um, for learners, but at the same time, right, and I'm feeling this as a, as a teacher educator, um, it's becoming increasingly challenging to teach. So what I think we could, and, and I'm talking in the K-12 space, but as well as higher ed, right? So I think what we could benefit from is um, more research, um, just fruitful, like dialogue that considers ways for Black women practitioners to engage in the struggle for justice healthfully and sustainably. So we know that Black women educators routinely, and I did when I was a classroom teacher, I do still in higher ed, right, routinely encounter threats of sexist, um, white supremacist backlash. That's through the prescribed curriculum, through punitive policies through administrative reprimand, right? Um, and that pushes amazing teacher activists out of the field. So um, I'll end on that. I, I'd like to see more research that investigates or investigations that provide in-depth focus on specific, I wanna see support structures um, that retain, that develop, and that reward justice-minded Black women educators. 
I'll stop there. Good. I know we are short on time, but we have some good questions in our Q&A uh, box. And one that I think is really, really important, Dr. Jacobs, can you take this one? How are we, or anybody, but how are we reimagining platforms such as this that is inclusive for Black women and Black girls with invisible and or visible disability diagnoses. And that's coming from Mercedes Cannon. Thank you, Mercedes, great question. Yes, thank you. And I would first say, you know, lift up Mercedes work in our book. So she wrote a chapter <laughs> just, about, just about that um, question about how do you make um, individuals who have disabilities, particularly black women and girls and the intersection of disability, how do you make that more visible? And also how do you support them in these different contexts? So. First off, I would say you have to read Mercedes's chapter in our book. Um, the other thing I would say too is the fact that we're all able to gather here in this space, in this virtual space where closed captioning is available, um, where people don't have to turn on their cameras, they can listen, they can be, they can take care of themselves as they're also soaking in the wisdom of our different contributors. I think that that is also a step forward and thinking about how we're becoming more inclusive of people who are neurodivergent or people who have disabilities. So that is my first hot take. Um, and I'll turn it over to the panelists if you have other thoughts about that. Yeah, so research shows, thank you, Mercedes. And yes, do read the chapter in the book. So research actually shows that we wanna get really specific that those black girls who are being harmed in our K through 12 system, they're actually more likely to have a visible or invisible disability. And they're also more likely to uh, be non-binary or identify with the LGBTQIA community. And so I think that that's really important who's actually being harmed and in what circumstances. And so this goes back to white supremacy, heteropatriarchy. Always comes back to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is so, um, Another question, and this is from Alana. Um, Alana said, Dr. Lane talked about disruption what Dr. Lane said about disruption is really so insightful. As a black woman, interdisciplinary education, sociology, junior scholar, who's going to be on the job market soon, my anxieties have been increasing. Do you have tips for maintaining community across disciplines, continuing this work and persisting despite messaging that jobs and opportunities are far and few between? So I guess to all of you, how do you stay energized and stay in this work when it is it can be so emotionally draining. Um, and there's a lot that we're fighting against when we're in the academy as well as outside of the academy. So how do you keep moving forward? I'll jump in. Um, I, I would love to see us um, focus a lot on, or a lot more on the ways that community organizing can be used to leverage folks inside and outside of the academy. If we think just about kind of uh, community organizing from like a methodological framework, all of that was set by a black woman. Ella Baker is the, the high empress of all things community organizing. And she had so many great strategies that have really um, trickled down into community-based organizations that are doing lots of work around, you know, changing legislation um, in the legal system, and pushing and advocating for for lots of things around disability rights, around um, you know advocacy in other arenas, and so I think the more that we can talk about what Ella Baker has left for us in terms of a legacy and how we can leverage her strategies inside the academy, I think we'll start to see a bridge between the two in a way that we haven't seen it probably since the civil rights movement. I mean, when we think back. The, the people who were so very active were college students, right? We think about the Bennett Bells and, and the, the guys at a and who, who, who worked on the sit-in. We think about the women in Greensboro who were getting arrested for protesting at movie theaters and pharmacies and all of these different pieces. Advocacy, protest, fighting back, resistance is in our DNA. It is what we do. And so to the extent that we can find ways to pull from that, again, inside and outside the academy to bring this bridge together. Once we do that, it's, it's over. It's over for everybody. 
Um, because when black women set, when we set our minds to do something, just it's done, it's over, get out the way. Um, you know, it's like when, um, I don't know if you've seen the clip going around the internet of, of Issa Rae interviewing Zendaya, where she's like, how do you wake up <laughs> and refrain from saying, nobody else has a chance, <laughs> right? That is the attitude that black women bring into everything that we do. And so when we're able to kind of put these different pieces together, that's when we start to build power in ourselves and build power in our communities. Because so junior scholars who are trying to figure out how to like, how to walk that line, um, I say, I, I think it is less about walking the line and more about recreating the lane. And when you recreate the lane, you decide what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, how you are going to involve the community and how this is going to uplift people who look like you, the black women and girls um, that, that are learning from your actions. If I could just say, oh, oh. <laughs> no, you go for it, you go for it, Dr. Hines, you go for it. All this intellect <laughs> at once is overwhelming. Um, I would add, I think, you know, for me, it's been important to not have the academy be my deathbed, right? So I love connecting with my community. That is my, the, the, my community is the academy and it's not on a college campus. It's my mom, it's my aunts, it's my cousins. It's, you know, reflecting on the fact that my grandmother, you know, being from North Carolina, didn't People didn't graduate high school. My grandparents didn't graduate high school. They don't have a diploma, but they still taught me things that were useful, even though their name will never be in a history book. They still taught me things about how to be connected to the people and to the work that I love. And, you know, that's something that you won't read in a textbook, but I don't need to. So again, just quickly for me, it's been to really be grounded um, most of my Facebook page are just people I grew up with. They are not academics. <laughs> you are not in my personal life like that. But it's making sure that just because you have the PhD behind your name, you're not forgetting where you came from and not being ashamed of that either. So that's just the part that I would add. Yeah, can I jump in really quick? Because I just want to talk about how important it is. Thank you so much for saying that, Dr. Dr. Hines, because it's so easy to get swept up in your academic identity that you that you can almost and all of the ways that that identity tries to erase the other parts of who you are and so one of the things that I have been committed to in and of myself as I sort of navigate you know my own trajectory is I'm I'm committed to being all all parts of Takia in every space and that that and recognizing and not, not judging or, or even trying to put them on any sort of hierarchy, because just like you, uh, Dr. Hines, my grandparents, you know, didn't go to college, but they taught me so many things and I hold them in the highest regard, just like I hold the, you know, many of the scholars that I also, you know, that I, that I consider as, as mentors. I'm here in, at my mom's house now, my grandmother is turning 90 tomorrow. And as we, and so I was just so excited to get to, to be a part of this. I feel like this is just the perfect thing because she just she's just so excited about this book and that it was about black girls and all of that. And so I just want, you know, we have to be intentional about holding on to who we are and our, our, our academic identities are a part of that. Um, that's absolutely true, but that, that's not the sum total of, of all that we bring. And thank you, Takia, for saying that, and Dorothy, because Takia, that's the one thing I remember about your story. I've been one of the most authentic and honest scholars. I came into this work sometimes not knowing better. And Takia, you and I had something in common, and that's why I remember you from that day. Yeah, because that was one of the first things you shared. And homage yeah. to your necklace, because you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dr. Jacobs, do you want to transition us? Yes. So I, I do want to lift up Dr. Steele also offered in the chat to Aaron's point about the lane, find a community who will keep you in that lane, remind you of your lane and accountable to your craft is necessary. So I feel like that's a good way to wrap up um, the panel part of our event um, because we are all hopefully holding each other accountable, reminding each other of why we do what we do and leaning on each other. 
for support and for inspiration. And I just wanna thank all of our panelists for being so thoughtful, for sharing so deeply and openly and honestly about your work. Um, and I'm just inspired once again. I mean, I'm inspired when you when you submitted your chapters for the book, but I'm even more inspired now to continue the conversation and the dialogues that we're having around supporting black women and girls. Um, and to build off of what Dr. Corbett was just saying around the importance of thinking about community organizing as another direction in which we support black women and girls, I wanna bring in our next chapter spotlight um, with Vivian Anderson. And Vivian Anderson, she co-authored the chapter, My Sister's Keeper, Intergenerational Love and Commitment Between Black Women and Girls. And Ms. Anderson is a healer activist who's dedicated to building a world where all black girls thrive. Her work is rooted in youth, teen, family, and community health and well-being, as well as racial and social justice. And she embodies the community organizing that Dr. Corbett was describing. And so I'm really excited for, um, for Ms. Anderson to be able to talk a little bit more about her work and about what she wants. Hi, I hope... So excuse me. So one of the things we get to do with Black women and girls facing race is COVID. I'm at the airport. I literally got to board a plane in 10 minutes. So um, thank you. I've been like so caught up. I don't want to miss my pain. So first, can you hear me? I'm okay. Okay. Because this you. background. Okay. And so one, I want to start by um, saying thank you for the sister earlier who gave me grace and space to be authentically me. We're saying like, yo, I don't know how I got on this book, but praise God, right? Um, so I would be remiss to not acknowledge Toby Jenkins, Henry, who invited me to co-author this because I'm not a doctor. I'm not what we call an academic. I'm the other that we refer to when we talk about things, all the other genius that comes out in this book. Um, so I want to start with this because I want to bring her into the room on this day because she can't be with us today. Somewhere I read that liberty, liberty is word spoken. It's the strong voice that America allows to be heard. That's only if you're speaking kind words. But my words are the truth, the conscience of America. You see, I had words back when the dictionary was a foreign language. I had speeches when the alphabet was a dream denied. I spoke the truth even when my English was supposedly broken and my life was threatened by the truth spoken. I was Nat Turner. I was that lady sojourner. I spoke of liberty. My, my mere existence in liberation. You are the one stuck in a dream. Wake up, America. And that's from Toby. She wrote that. So I wanted to bring her into the room. Um, and so many of everybody <laughs> spoke about so much. Um, I'm gonna read some excerpts from the book that I wanna like really bring out that I think wraps up some stuff. So every black girl, EB, every black girl is EBG. EBG was birthed out of a response to attacks on black girls. We built ourselves from within starting with community. We have created a space where the community became responsible for itself and others in the community. This concept of community accountability and responsibility is not a new one. We have historical context from which to learn. It takes a village. It's not just a quote we throw around, but a belief system that we live. We clearly understand that we must not put parameters on who can be a part of the village, who can help and who can be a mentor. To do that is to engage in the same social pressures to conform that we fight against. Some of our adult educators and elders aren't perfect, but they are present. They care, their experiences are important and their wisdom is rich. They matter. If we all live by the principle that everyone matters and contributes to this world, then we might be able to make a real in world source change. And then lastly, I want to say, because I'm helping y'all, because y'all got some questions. So I'm trying to answer those questions in these answers. Um, our resi so recipes for resistance, how we do this work. Our resistance takes the form of doing the important work of raising and educating whole sane, positive souls who can contribute to the world. In this type of resistance, we teach Black girls to express 
themselves when society has told them to tone down their personality. We teach them to speak when society has told them to be quiet. We teach them to stand like Shirley Chisholm, to sit like Rosa Parks, or take a knee like Representative Sheila Jackson Lee when it is necessary. We teach them to love. We teach them to laugh. We teach them it is also okay to cry. We teach them to resist. Um, and because I do have to catch a plane and I know that people probably have more questions than I have answers for, I wanna leave space because like I said, because Toby brought me into this room, I wanna be here for everybody who's also here. Um, but I also know I got a plane to catch because I get to be with families in Florida that I've been working with who've been harmed by sanct sanctioned violence. And um, go by the book, book and you'll get all the information that you need to know about everything I've been talking about. So that's what I would say, my, my action, go get the book. But if I can do it like a, like a selfish plug, On These Grounds is a documentary on Stars, Amazon Prime, iTunes, YouTube, and Apple TV, On These Grounds. And it looks at the um, policing in schools and it looks at the Salt Spring Valley and what has happened since then on the state and national level. So. Mary, I was going to do your plug. You know I'm your hype. You know I'm your hype girl. I was going to do your plug. <laughs> I had you. I got you. <laughs> so I'll see you next week. <laughs> right. Right. So on the grounds. <laughs> All right. So we just posted it in the chat. Safe travels, Vivian. Okay. I didn't know if there were questions. I, I wanted to like, I don't want to, like, if there was a question, I wanted to like cut off some of my time if there was a question or two. I don't want to, because people are out there. So I, I, I want I want to give as much as I've received because I've been receiving this whole time. I'm about to go to Florida and be reciting all this stuff. I love it. Anybody, any Thank questions you. while we have Vivian? She's about to board a plane in less than five minutes. This is the time. Throw it in the chat. So, uh, okay. Anybody, any questions? Any questions? So Vivian, I'm going to uplift the question since we have it. And I know okay. that you're on the front line with our girls. So can you speak, uh, can you talk about, when we do have girls who are suffering, uh, how should we think about our relationship with those who have done, done harm to us? So what do you suggest? So ask that question, because I heard two questions in that, say that again. So we know that you work with girls who have been harmed or experienced serious trauma at the hands of adults, uh, including police officers or state sanctioned uh, or white vigilantes, as I would call them. So how do what is the recovery process like? How do we begin to heal from that? How do girls do? How do we help girls heal from that based off your experience? And so this is the part that I'm probably going to upset everybody. Acknowledge the harm that you did to girls. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes when we're talking about education, our girls are not just afraid of the education. Because part of the reason that Toby wrote this and invited me in, because we get to look at the complexity of it all, right? We get to look at our love for education, our disappointment. Because let me tell you, a lot of our girls is, are in schools with people that look like them who don't treat them as somebody who's worthy of something else. So we also have to like acknowledge it's not just the other treating our girls this way. And then from there, we ask the girls what healing looks like versus trying to make it up in our head. I can't answer that question for every girl in the world. I can tell you my perspective and it's always ask the girl. You can always ask me and I'm gonna always ask you to ask the girl because every time I ask your girl, it's a different converse, it's a different response. I'm like, Oh, you just need this. Oh, you just need this. Or you just need this. So it's always asking the girl, but not take, but also remembering what would, what did I need? Because that takes us in a different space. What did I need when I was that girl hurting? It may be not be on the same spectrum as some of these other girls, but what was it? Did my mom work too much? Did, the, did my dad work too much? Or did I have a mom not working? Did I have a not, dad not working? Or do I have to stay in a state, state facility? What is it that I needed? And then I'll move from there. Great answer. So I just put in the chat. Um, I put in the chat. This is, be, this is going down in history. Uh, basically, look at the harm that you've done to Black girls. 
Love it. And when I tell you I don't talk about anything I don't know, I've been on a healing journey with healing my harm to Black girls that I didn't even think I did. But I did it because I thought I knew what was best and it wasn't the best thing for them. And they were telling me and I didn't hear them because I'm like, no, you need to do this. But I hadn't done my work. Yep. And I also put in the chat, heal thyself. As Vivian knows, we both were in the uh, documentary together, Push Out. And she's one of the uh, co-authors in this book of her chapter. And uh, as a licensed clinical social worker, a licensed clinical psychotherapist, as a clinical complex trauma professional uh, and a clinical trauma uh, professional as well, trust you me, we have to do the work before we think we can step in and heal black girls and black women because many of us have been broken and we are doing further harm, Vivian. So thank you, thank you. It's an ongoing process when you're working with black girls and young women, when you're working with any people. We take yeah, it for and because we got letters and commas or adults that we know what we're doing. Yes, we Yeah, do. and I'm gonna leave, um, and to know that we are not a monolith, right? We all are black girls and women, but we come from so many different spaces. So it's one of those things like my, even now when folks like, oh, we need all black teachers in the room. I say, ah, real quick, can I say, can I say something about that? Hold up, <laughs> right? And that's how girls are experiencing it too. So I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. I hate that I have to leave because I've been, this has been juicy. I want to connect with everybody. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you haven't gotten a book, I hope you win the prize. And if you haven't gotten a book, if you want to invest in anything, if you believe in this work, invest in this book because it will take you beyond what any other, all of them, they, they got nothing to give the way this book gives some stuff. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm sorry, y'all, I do have to run off. And um, Venus and everybody, I'll talk to y'all soon. Thank you, safe travel. Yes, Thank Marcus you. Garvey said we can't take, we don't want to take them all back to Africa, to be clear. <laughs> and Harriet said sometimes we got to leave some of y'all behind so y'all can figure it out for yourselves and get there on your train. We all get to go, but we don't all have to go on the same boat or boat, bus, boat, or train. Real talk. That's a love, Praxy, right there. Right. Selling front porch politics. Dr. Jacobs. Thanks, Vivian, and safe travels. And just as Vivian was saying and hyping our book at the end, so we've come to the end of our event here. And so first I just wanna share the raffle winners and then um, a few appreciations before we close out. So the raffle winners are Ruth Wang, Tolu Taiwo and Trisha Shalka. And I think um, Patty who is with Stylus will follow up with you all um, about getting your copy of our book. And thank you for entering the raffle. And for those of you who entered the raffle but didn't win, there will also be, um, we'll also send you some information about a discount code that you can use to buy our book. And it'll, well, I think we'll also put it in the chat too. So just to close, I'd like to close first with some thank yous and appreciation. So first a huge warm thank you to Jasmine Abukar. So she's been off screen this whole time, but she is the logistical mastermind <laughs> behind this event. We literally would not have an event without Jasmine. So thank you, Jasmine. And I know that you, in addition to, to organizing this event, you've been doing other things, getting ready to that next step in your career as a scholar. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've done. Um, I also want to thank our book contributors. Thank you for saying yes when we reached out to you and we pitched this book project to you years ago now. Um, we recognize that as Black women, we all have different things that pull our attention, both professionally and personally. And so the fact that you made space in your lives for us and for this book, we are eternally grateful. And lastly, thank you to all of you who attended this event and who continue to support us and our work and our scholarship, and also to support the Black women and girls in their educational journeys. Um, it's a collective, it's something that collectively we have to do, we can't do it alone. And so the fact that we're all here talking about what it means to invest in the educational success of Black women and girls is only gonna help us to move forward in that work. So thank you all of you. I don't know, Dr. Lori or Dr. V, if you want to say anything before I hand it back over to Patty to close out. 
I think you summed up everything well. Thank you for being a wonderful facilitator. Um, this was really a dream come true. And I just love to be able to sit back and watch and observe. And I just love the conversation. And I hope the experience for, for this launch was as meaningful for you all um, as it has been for me. Yes, thank you, uh, Charlotte. It's 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 a blessing. I, I very rarely use those words to witness your, your growth intellectually and spiritually. Uh, thank you, Lori, for being you. That's what I have to say. <laughs> and thank you to all of our, you know, authors of the text. And also thank you to stylists. Uh, again, I think we just made history. Thank you, stylists. Uh, I think Dr. Patton Davis already hinted at it. Uh, this is very rare for Black women to have an entire book and for it to not only be published, but also marketed appropriately. So uh, we broke a record. The, I mean, we had we had a, a problem like two or three weeks ago. I think we were sold out and then we weren't sold out, but then we found some more books. So yes, please participate in the raffles. So uh, thank you also to all of our sister scholars that are here on the webinar. And if any of our brothers or, or, you know, siblings and cousins and them are here. Thank you all too. This is definitely the family reunion. More than you all know, I've witnessed a lot of these women. Uh, all of us grow spiritually, intellectually, and culturally, uh, if not materially. So uh, thank you all to our audience for being here with us today, standing with us. Ubuntu, right? I am because we are. This is the family reunion. I don't cook, but I do wash dishes. Okay. We all have our part. <laughs> we all have our part. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Patty from Stylus, who's going to close out and tell you where you can get our book and also share with you next steps about uh, this webinar. All right. Thank you all. And thank you to our authors and contributors for sharing their time and celebrating this incredible book with us today. Um, and thank you to everyone who tuned in live with us this afternoon on Zoom. If you're interested in ordering, investing in the educational success of Black women and girls, use code INVEDU20 to get 20% off the book and free shipping from Stylus. I will share the link and code in the chat bar. The webinar video replay will be available tomorrow and shared on all of our Stylus social media feeds. Uh, so have a look out for that email. You will get a direct link. Also visit our Stylus webinar calendar online to check out our upcoming spring webinar events. If you have any feedback from this webinar or any requests for future events, please feel free to email us directly at stylusinfo at styluspub.com. Thanks again and have a great afternoon, everyone. I will stay a little bit longer so that way if anyone wants to copy anything from the chat, uh, please feel free to do so. If you have any last minute questions for our panelists, this has been a great event. Thank you all so much. Great. Thanks so much.